Welcome to the If I Had More Time podcast at Mariner's Church. This podcast series invites you into a casual conversation with our senior pastor, Eric Geiger, and our teaching team to hear a few helpful insights and truths they wish they had time to include in the weekend message. Be sure that you have listened to this weekend's message prior to listening to the podcast so you get the most out of our current series. We hope you enjoy it. Thank you guys so much for joining us for the If I Had More Time podcast. We are back for week two in our series, James, which is already so amazing. We have our senior pastor, Eric Geiger, and our outreach pastor, Gloria Bashara. Gloria, we're so glad that you're here. I'm so glad to be here. Well, we are going to jump into all kinds of seek the good and hearing about the amazing opportunities that are going to be placed before our church to step into serving and being generous. But first, I did want to just jump in with you, Eric, yeah. and ask you, first of all, first say, what an amazing message. I'm so challenged, so convicted by so many things in the message this weekend. And I'm really excited to see how our church is shaped afterwards. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you if you had had any more time on more than hearers in this passage, right. what would you have shared? Yeah. I mean, the, I love that text that we walked through so much this weekend. I, I, I could have spent probably half an hour on each of those three points. You know, I, I, the word saves, sanctifies, and then sends. You know, if I had more time, I would have, we would have had a really long church service and, and I would have spent a lot more time on each of those. You know, the, on, I'll just kind of add a little bit of more content for each. So the word saves, you know, the Apostle Paul said something very similar to what James is saying in Romans 10. I would have spent more time on this. Consequently, faith, this is Romans 10, verse 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Mm -hmm. So what James is saying, Paul said, um, and Peter said something very similar about the word in First Peter, about the word giving us birth. And so they're all saying, you, you didn't wake up one day and think, I need, to, I need something new in my life. I need to, I need to become a Christian. Hmm. That's not what happened, that it took the word to awaken you to your need for Jesus. Hmm. You were dead. You need to be made alive. And the word is what God used to quicken your heart, to, to enlighten your soul, to wake you up and cause you to realize that you needed Jesus. The word is what drew you. You were in awe of his grace, his love. And so God used his word to recreate you, to make you brand new, to make you alive. Just as he, he made the world out of nothing, he, he, remade you out of your sin. I mean, wow. he completely woke you up, changed you, made you alive. Mm. And so I would have spent more time on that. And so secondly, the word sanctifies, I would have spent more time just even sharing some practical research. I was a part of multiple projects in my last life when I was in publishing about how Christians grow. So we were really, that mattered a lot to us because we wanted to create resources that helped Christians grow. And a book called The Shape of Faith to Come was written by the executive vice president of the company, Brad Wagner. Um, it was a massive research project, and he concluded from all the research that the number one discipline that you participate in, in terms of the spiritual discipline that the Bible teaches you, prayer, worship, mm -hmm. studying the scripture, fasting, giving, you know, all of the disciplines, that the one, from a research perspective, that makes the biggest impacting your life is time in the word. Mm. And then I wrote a book with Michael Kelly and Philip Nation called Transformational Discipleship that was another research project. And we found that the one spiritual discipline that impacts every other spiritual discipline is the word. So someone can participate in the spiritual discipline of giving. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna serve or someone who serves may not give. But somebody who's in the Word, they do all the disciplines. If you're in the Word, you share your faith. If you're in the Word, you give. If you're in the Word, you serve. If you're in the Word, you care for the, the poor and the vulnerable and the orphan and the widow. That the Word does the work of changing you. Mm. And so if you're not being changed, you, you, you aren't in the Word. Wow. Or, I and mean, this, this doesn't happen because a non-Christian doesn't love the Word, but... People ask Kay sometimes, why do you like it that Eric's a pastor more than in his last job? I mean, in my last job, 
I had I spent time in God's Word every day. I would wake up and have a devotional, you know, just like I ask our people to. I was a good, you were a regular Christian. Christian. I was a great <laughs> regular Christian. I wasn't the best, but I was a regular Christian who spent time in God's Word. Um, but I didn't spend like twenty five hours a week in the Word. Mm. Well, now I I don't, you know, spend a lot of time in Excel spreadsheets. I spend a lot of time in in the message Scripture prep. in message prep. And Kay is like, you are such a better husband <laughs> and dad and man and oh, Christian. Yeah. And I'm and I tell her, if I'm not, then I'm not a Christian. Because if you spend 20 hours a week in the scripture and you aren't being changed, then you don't have the Spirit of God. Yeah. If you have the Spirit of God within you and you spend that much time in the Bible, you're going to be changed. Yeah. The, the word is going to sanctify you. It can't not. You it can't, can't come out the same. It, you, it's impossible because, because this is the Word of God, the breathed Word of God. Now, you can spend 25 hours a week in some other book and be the exact same person, have more intellect maybe, you know, learn some things that you didn't know before, but you won't necessarily grow. You won't. You won't grow spiritually like you do hmm. if you're in the Word. So that would be if I had more time on point two, and then we'll spend the rest of the podcast on if I had more time on point three. Just... James's understanding of the Old Testament comes out in his yeah. challenge to widow and orphan. He, he, he really, it's really just beautiful what he does. So he's Jewish, so he knew all that God had introduced himself as in the past, which is the defender of widows, the, the one who cares for the orphan, the one who, who cares for those who are oppressed and vulnerable. Yeah. Um, God was always introducing himself as that in the Old Testament, which was really... Shocking because the pagan little G gods always would identify with the powerful, but our God identifies with the weak. Mm -hmm. And so James ties back to his Jewish history and reminds them, because he's writing to the scattered tribes, so the 12 tribes of Israel who have now become Christian and they're scattered throughout the world. So he, he brings them back to their, their historical roots that this is who God is, but he modernizes it. I mean, we're reading 2,000 years later. But for them, he modernizes it and reminds them that you you were oppressed and God rescued you. You you were made alive by the word. And here's what pure religion is. Let's not be like the religious leaders who've persecuted mm -hmm. us. Let's not be like the religious leaders who killed Jesus. But true religion is that we're going to be unaffected uh, by the world, but we're also going to care for the widow and the orphan. And, and I'm, think about who he's writing. He's writing people who had been persecuted. They had a lot of struggles in their lives. And he's not yeah. He's not saying, hey, let's just be sad about our lives. Let's yeah. care for the people who are really suffering, the, the widow and the orphan. He's identifying with the, the, the Old Testament. He's identifying with their current situation. And we'll talk about this next week on the If I Had More Time podcast with a special guest. But basically history tells us that these early Christians, they actually read these words and then they, they changed the. They did the. They did this. They changed yeah. the world. So in the Roman Empire, if if you, you know, oftentimes girls would be discarded because having a, a a male son was the most important thing in that culture, and it was Christians who stepped into trash dumps where children were being discarded and adopted those kids. Mm -hmm. It was Christians who stopped infanticide. Uh, it was Christians who actually are credited with stopping the gladiator games. It was Christians who. Um, cared for the widows in a culture, because in the Roman culture, if you had a husband who passed, he, you wouldn't get his mm -hmm. resources, and women found solace and refuge in the church, mm -hmm. and so the church cared for the widow. You have a, you have a letter in the, in the um, New Testament where the Apostle Paul talks about being sure that widows are on the, on the list of care, mm -hmm. that, hey, so evidently the church, they had a database of the widows, and they cared for the widows, and yeah. no one else was doing that. So these early Christians read, they got scattered around the world, their lives have been in upheaval, and they're taking the time to care for the widows and orphans. The faith spread like wildfire. Here we are 2,000 years reading the source document <laughs> of what changed the world, and part of, part of that source document was a command to care for the widow and the orphan, to care for the vulnerable, to seek the good of those people and to seek the good of the cities. 
And that's what they did. And here we are 2000 years later. So amazing. I'm understanding now for, for those that are listening, Eric had shared with the team of us when he was first sharing his manuscript with everybody that he wouldn't feel honorable teaching this text right. without these opportunities to, so for, for, for our outreach ministries. It would be so hard to walk through the book of James as a, as a pastor who wants to not just preach to our people, but then help them obey. I don't want to just like say, hey, go do this, and then they have no way to do it. Yeah. So for our outreach team to be so skilled at what our outreach team does is really a gift to yeah. our church. It's also a gift to me. Because I'm able to preach this passage with great conviction yeah. and then say, hey, here's some things you can do. I know you want to care for the widow and the orphan. We have ways that you can do this. Here's how you do this. Yeah. Right. Outreach is such a special, special part of our totally. DNA. It's who yeah. we are. You know, it's not just a ministry. It That's is right. is who we are. I have a special place in my heart because I, I was an intern with Outreach way back yes, in the day. You were. It was where I began. Wait, wait, College wait. age <laughs> what, baby list. What, what year what year was that? 2017. Mm-hmm. So two thousand seven. It was pre. It was pre Eric. So you were here. The I when did I, I started in in eighteen. Uh huh. So you were here summer of seventeen. Yep. It was right when they made the announcement that they that Kenton would be looking for his successor. Wow. Yeah, I was here in a really interesting time. Yeah. Eric's doing I math. In, I'm doing the math. <laughs> I was in maybe year three or four of being on staff. But I remember. Yeah. I remember. Did you call young it baby, 20s you, Liz. You call it baby Liz. <laughs> L- little baby intern Liz. Little baby Liz. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you something. Was she Roddy was on so staff? capable. Was you, he was. Was, was we, he in the outreach team? He was. Did you guys interact at all? We have we have a memory of one interaction. Really? It wasn't. It, he actually hates when I tell people that I was an intern on his team because it sounds creepy. <laughs> <laughs> you see, only so, had one interaction. That I can remember. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe just one of significance. I'm sure there was team meetings or oh, something yes. where yes. they were both in the same space. Of course. But yes. The sparks yes. weren't flying when no. <laughs> Liz was little baby Liz. Little in baby Liz. Anyways, little this, little is a, this is about the beauty of our <laughs> outreach ministries. <laughs> but I did. I, I yeah, that's, you that's did. Special. Part that's of special. the reason that I fell in love with Mariners was how we thought about our neighbor, how mm-hmm. we thought about those that are in our communities and in our cities that we are called to serve, to love. And we do it in a unique way that is from the scripture. And you guys can actually learn about it. If you open up your series guides in James, we have some specific content set aside. That's all about teaching a little bit about our outreach ministries and something that we call our outreach distinctives. And Man, they are powerful. They are a picture of God's love, both for for us and through us to our neighbors. So, Gloria, would you be able to break down those outreach distinctives for us? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that obviously God's word is our guide. Um, But then where do we go from there, right? What kind of ministry, what type of outreach church do we want to be? And it's really these distinctives, a fancy word for values, that kind of help create those pillars and those avenue to know what's a yes for us for us, and then maybe what's a no for us. So, you know, one of the highest values is an understanding of true poverty. And you've touched on that in in this week's message. The idea that what Jesus did and accomplished on the cross, one, leveled the playing field for all of us, but then also for the Christian, we can more easily identify with the orphan, with the widow, with those that are marginalized or under-resourced because we had to recognize those gaps and losses yeah. in ourselves. Yeah. We in- had to realize that we were poor spiritually. Exactly. That we were broken. Yeah. Exactly. And while that being our starting point, we all also experience those, continue to experience those gaps and losses even today. So when we're inviting people to serve, it's not just, you know, someone who um, has an abundance to someone who maybe has a scarcity. It's two people coming together. We like to say in outreach, proximity changes everything. Yeah. It's two people coming together that maybe in everyday life wouldn't. But what they come together with is them both realizing there are losses and gaps on both sides. And there are very beautiful and essential things that they can offer each other. Mm -hmm. So that idea of reciprocity um, and 
that truth that comes from a true biblical understanding of the word poverty, mm. of scarcity and gap and loss in all of our lives that we all experience. So that's kind of, um, you know, step one, value one. And another value is relationship-based ministry. And so we'll get into, right, our food insecurity initiatives yeah. and food pantry and all of that. But one of the real things that's helping us make that turn is that we really have a high regard for bringing people together. Yeah. For not just uh, meeting needs, but for also creating friendships, creating right. avenues where uh, a community, an issue, a people group becomes a person, a face, a friend, a family, yeah. right? I love that as we talk about in the in the message, making a, a shift from box model to yeah. choice model. If the outreach, if our value in outreach was efficiency, as opposed box to box model forever, yeah, as opposed we would never to relationship, change. right? Mm -hmm. If it was efficiency, it'd be like, oh, like we we can just crank out as many boxes as possible in the food pantry, and that's efficient. Yeah. But because the 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 value is relationship ministry, the question then is, how do we have better conversations? How do we more at how do we aptly and accurately value yeah. the image of God in each person? Mm -hmm. You know, this this, this model will will feel more dignified for the individual. Absolutely. We'll honor them more. Yeah. And I think that there is when we say, you know, it's it's relationships, it's people coming together, um, it's stepping into friendships and proximity and all of that. We're really kind of elevating the power of transformative relationships, right? We're elevating the power of, yes, I, there are going to be some actual tangible needs that someone uh, might need. But oftentimes for all of us, like we get broken and bruised in relationships. There's also so much healing power in relationships. Yeah. And so they really are an avenue into kind of strengthening that social circle, which I mean, I don't know for you all, but your my support system, my family, my life group, my friends, like I can get through really, really hard times if I've got a really great support system. Yeah. yeah. So it's really kind of elevating and amplifying even people's social circle, people that know your name and know what you're going through. Having a friend in any hard time, it's a game changer. It's a deal breaker. Like it just changes everything um, rather than having to face that alone mm -hmm. or having to face it mm -hmm. um, on your own with whatever resources that yeah, you might need. So relationships is a, is a huge one um, to kind of, you know, name the other ones. Servant leadership is huge, right? We don't want to necessarily go in with all the answers and a really gr great idea and the solution to everyone's problems because that's not how Jesus entered our world right? He entered our world as a servant. Mm -hmm. He humbled himself. And so we um, do want to uh, lead from our convictions of caring for the vulnerable, of stepping boldly in, inviting our whole church to step in, but doing so in a servant, with a servant's posture, um, servant leadership that says, I want to understand and get to know um, you. I want to understand what maybe, you know, modern expressions of the widow might be in our culture today. Yeah. And I want to grow in my understanding of what that means before, um, but before creating and forming maybe solutions to certain problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, that was so helpful. What, how you broke down and explained why a widow ought to be cared for in that time. It isn't quite as obvious for us today sometimes. Yeah. And, and we might've actually talked about this recently that our idea of a widow today is Probably not somebody who is in immediate desperate need of care all the time. Yeah. But There's some widows. So a widow in James's culture would have, I mean, unless she had been socking away resources while her husband was alive. Sure. Um, it, it was common for the widow to, to be vulnerable in that day because yeah. it was a male-dominated society. Yeah. In our culture, thankfully... That um, when a husband passes away, oftentimes because of an insurance policy or because the the family did planning, mm -hmm. that that the, the the widow may not be in a now clearly there's there's relational pain. Absolutely, we need to surround people who've lost a spouse. But in terms of economic impact or the inability to provide for oneself, in our current culture, that's not always the same as it was in the ancient 
culture in which James was writing. Sure. So what we, what we've asked is, well, then what are the mm-hmm. the the widows in our culture, or mm-hmm. what are the vulnerable that have that relational loss or that gap in in care? Yeah. Which is what the outreach team's done the work and and looked at groups of people who who are suffering a gap in care or a gap in loss. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and um, really kind of seeing the ways that uh, those that loss of support system and asking ourselves who in our community, um, who in our area has that felt need where it really is that lack of support system um, that creates those kind of fractures and fissures in their everyday life. Um, you know, what is that experience like for the single mother or the single parent mm-hmm. um, who's living every single day yeah. uh, without the presence, the protection and the provision of a um, support system? Mm-hmm. You know, what kind of gaps might that cre- might that create? Um, what kind of loss um, might that create? And also what kind of internal wrestles might that create for someone who's maybe questioning um, their worth and their value, mm. yeah. who's maybe functioning functioning chronically in survival mode, right? Um, and where would that send you? Right. And then, you know, again, what would resources, yeah. a friend, community, and how could that impact that experience for anyone who's living with that chronic separation from that support yeah. system? And And so there's a lot of ministries that, and when you look in the the guide, the series guide, you'll you'll see some of the ministries that we have, such as we care for foster and we and we care for military. Mm-hmm. And and in both of those, there's a sense of widow and orphan, even though that that family and military might be married. But when the when the 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 person who's active service is gone for six months at a time, That's yeah. right. there's some there's definitely some loss there. There's a gap in care. Absolutely. We step in and care for our military families, or I mean, just statistically, we know that it's really sad that the, some of the highest divorce rates in terms of profession is in the military. I mean, it's, it's a lot of stress on the marriage. So we want to step in and care for our military families. At the same time, there's children in the foster care system in Southern California that have were, biological family members and maybe even foster family member people that have stepped in. There are people. And yet, um, maybe because of lack of tools or cycles at play, there's likely some, you know, gaps in their very early and critical developmental years yes. um, that create kind of um, a sense of need or a desire or opportunity for even more Right, resources right. and people to kind of and come so we around. we want to come in and step in. Mm-hmm. We step in. We have a very vibrant foster foster care ministry, mm-hmm. so we step in there. The ministry that we really emphasize this weekend, and I really do encourage you to read in the magazine about all of the ones that we have. But I I don't think we've ever on this podcast when we've been doing this for year, over a year and a half now. Gosh, almost coming up on two years, we've not taken some time and talked about the food pantry. Now, obviously. Some of our listeners serve in the food pantry. We have volunteers, but there's three of them that we currently have mm-hmm. Mar- at Mariners Irvine, Huntington Beach, and Santa Ana. Yes. Let's do a deeper dive on the food pantry. Sure. And who, we serve about 2,000 individuals a month. Families. Yeah. We. So it's interesting with that statistic. We serve um, and we kind of, um, you know, categorize or total households, right? That's how we um, collect that data is how many households do we serve? And so it's 2000 households, but really when you add up individuals and family members within those households, it's closer to seven or 8,000. Oh, dang. I gotta say that I gotta go with the bigger stat. You gave me the. You gave me the I gave you the small stat. What was I the, doing? You gave me the low ball stat. And that that's how we measure is individuals, two thousand individuals and families. Really, what we're saying is two thousand households. Gosh, that's but a ton of people. Add up that, when all I say of a ton, that's actually a ton is two thousand. <laughs> that is that is a ton times four. It's a couple yeah, times. That's yeah. amazing. Closer to eight thousand. Wow! And well done, Mariners Church. Well done, Mariners Church. Well done, food pantry volunteers. Yes. Come and on. What I will say is there's so much to affirm. I know we're talking about the transition from box model to choice model and more shopping experience. But the box model served us so well Mm. as we were doing the early grounds of this ministry. Yeah. And especially during the pandemic. Yes. Yes. If you remember, it was less than 24 hours that we turned around 
um, you know, once shutdowns happen. Mm. And because we had box model, because we had that efficiency yep. in place, within 24 hours, we were a distribution center overnight. It's amazing. And it's that box model that Our allowed us to distribute and support thousands in a lot of our local yeah. outreach ministries. There's some beautiful stories that came out of our church during that time, during those early days of COVID, because mm -hmm. of the people in our church who gave so sacrificially and generously to the food pantry and, and with their, also with their financial gifts that allowed us. I mean, I, I know, for example, where we have a Mariners hosted here as part of, we did food distribution early oh, yeah. in some places that we now have long-term partnerships. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I just do agree. Let's affirm the past. We're not at all saying that Absolutely. No, not I mean, at all. It was beautiful what God did. And but it's amazing, too, that we are committed to learning and tweaking yeah. in areas where Absolutely. we can improve. We always will be. We Absolutely. Want to. And I think, you know, one of the things we say is, um, you know, a crisis situation, it should be met with a crisis response. A chronic situation should be met with a chronic response, a long term, sustainable response. And so the learning in this season is that food scarcity in Southern California specifically is rising, you know, exponentially. And know, we I, have felt it yeah. at these three sites. So both at Irvine, Santa Ana, Huntington Beach, on any given day, you know, we used to take that box model and we'd make it relational because we are relationship-based ministry. Mm -hmm. We'd take the time, we'd hang out with people, but as the needs have grown, and as the influx of households has grown, well, now we see kind of lines that wrap around our buildings. Right. Santa Ana, I've Irvine. Seen the pictures. You've yeah. seen the photos. And it is shortening that interaction time because the need is increasing. So, box model yeah. on a really heavy day, you know, our interactions with individuals can be a minute or less. Mm. And that's why. Now that we know, now that we've learned, now that we've kind of peeked out a little bit from maybe that crisis response, and we want to go into what does the long-term approach to this ever-growing need in our area look like, we want to meet that with the response of, well, maybe now let's shift and create yeah. a little bit of, a, of an environment, of an experience, of a shopping I love it. type environment. And then they're able to have conversations with our volunteers, mm -hmm. but they're also able to choose what they want for their family as opposed to, hey, th th we put a box together of what you'll be eating over the next week. Mm -hmm. They have an opportunity. I, it just feels more honoring Absolutely. Of, of the person. Absolutely. Yeah. And being able to have um, that environment where you're able to make the choices um, given your preferences, um, the ages in your, your kids, uh, yeah. of your kids, you yeah. know, mom knows best mom of what, best. of what her family needs. So being able to give that permission um, over, it is honoring, it is dignifying and kind of a, a, a mantra we've been saying as we've been coaching the teams, getting everyone excited about um, choice model is options are honoring mm -hmm. options are empowering and we know that to be true yeah. when our when when we're in crisis or when we're kind of feeling stressed out um being able to know or being able to slow down and see it's not just the rock in a hard place to not great options there's actually more yeah. like we know that's a good exercise for us when we're in high stress how much more so to someone that's kind of experiencing scarcity on a chronic, that's great. in a chronic way? Hey, I'm curious. I know that that you're close to to a lot of the needs within our county and mm -hmm. all of Southern California as a whole as we serve with outreach. What insight are you hearing on why the rise? Is it a lot of it because of inflation? You know, the the increase. What was it? Nine point eight to fifteen percent. I mean, yeah, significant increase yeah. in those that are living with food insecurity? I think uh, there's an element where one, I think we're still living in a post pandemic um, world, even though we all feel really, really removed from that. We know that, um, you know, there was a lot of um, disparities and additional hardships and people are still kind of um, making their way out of that, especially if they were in already under-resourced, um, you know, communities or situations. And then now on this side of the economy and housing yeah. um, and jobs where they're at, it really is the opportunity for m much needed um, and really precious resources going 
where there's immediate need and this being a relief valve. This is one less thing that someone who is thinking through job, housing, schools, car, insurance, medical needs, it's the relief valve right now for a lot of folks is being able to have their um, food needs met in a kind and compassionate environment um, so that they can focus on other areas of need. Great. That's one. There's so many, yeah. but that no, is one, yeah. Um, yeah. one, one framework. Yeah. But the, the rise is, it's sad. It is. You know, and, and, but we want to, we want to step in and be a part of serving people in the midst of yeah. the pain. I mean, that's painful. Yeah. yeah. And I think that the stats, um, and you know, whatever the current temperature of the culture is, those are always so helpful to inform us, uh, to help us learn, pivot, shift when we need to. But we also know that our convictions as outreach ministries comes from God's word. And even as you kind of invited us, like letting that obedience be enough too is, you know, even if it wasn't on the rise, even if it wasn't, um, if, even if it didn't feel like such a heightened crisis, um, we're still responsible for the widow and the orphan. We're still responsible at the end of the day to be the local church, which is the hope of the world, um, and meet the felt needs in our community. Even if it was just our neighbors across the street here in Irvine at UCI and the college students that are inundated and have an influx of financial burden as they step into their university years, even if it was just for them, Mm -hmm. I still firmly believe that we would be here, you know, yeah, wanting to serve them and honor them as best we could. Yeah. Gloria, why don't you walk us through what the experience is like at all three of our locations for food pantries? Sure, yeah. sure. So there's a little bit of a mix. Um, you know, Irvine Food Pantry has been around for a number of years. So they're able to open their doors four, sometimes five times a week um, to the community. And they've, um, this is where we're beta testing a lot of our choice model right now. So they've make, made some crawl steps towards um, having a shopping type of environment. And what that looks like right now is like a little mini farmer's market, right? Where there's tents and tables and you kind of go through your produce, your pantry staples, your fresh breads. Um, And so it feels a little bit like a food pantry. uh, It feels a little bit like a farmer's market environment right now. And the team's really excited about the ways that they've been able to kind of shift that focus. If you hop on over to um, congregations like Santa Ana and Huntington Beach, uh, right now they're open either, you know, once a week on Saturday mornings or every other week on Saturday mornings. And really it's an opportunity to be invitational to the community that they're in proximity in. So while Irvine is a little bit of a regional, you know, people are, people are making the choice that the drive is worth it Mm. to make it out this way because they know they're going to be met with care and the resources that they need. For Santa Ana and Huntington Beach, they're in really close proximity where you're having friends and neighbors that are coming um, with strollers, with wagons, with kiddos. They're coming walking yeah. a lot of the time, the majority of um, the neighbors that we're able to serve. And so they each have their own you know, unique opportunities to serve their community well. Um, and each will kind of be making that slow shift. Huntington Beach, candidly, has led the way um, in a lot of this and is a little bit closer to that shopping experience. The fun thing about our Huntington Beach and Santa Ana congregations is it's their church lobby and their worship center. So cool. So they get to invite their community and say, hey, that door you came in on Saturday uh, for our food pantry ministry and prayer and a friendly face, come back tomorrow through the same door yeah. in the same environment. I'm glad you shared that. You I, and I want to, I just want to be sure people heard it. Cause if you attend Mariners Irvine, the food pantry is in the community center. Sure. So you might park on that side of the campus or you might know, Oh yeah, it's over there. It's on the other side of the lake from the worship center. But if you're at Mariners Huntington beach or Mariners Santa Ana, we set up the food pantry on Saturdays in the, the, the same area, the same in Huntington Beach, the foyer, yeah. and in Santa Ana, the worship center. Yes. And so th- where we have it is where we have church, which is, it's just beautiful. 
it's also, I want to, for those of you who gave to multiply and we saw congregations you know, throughout Southern California, you're not just given to a place where we are having church. You're, we, well, we are having, we're having church in different ways. We're having church on Saturday. Yeah. We're having church on exactly. Sunday. Just different expressions. Yeah, we're given, we're given the, the physical bread on Saturday yes. and we're given the spiritual bread on Sunday. We're showing the good news That's of right. Jesus through meeting people's needs on and Saturday. Sharing it. We're sharing the good news That's of right. Jesus on Sunday That's right. by sharing God's word. So Amen. awesome. Man, we put a pretty audacious goal in front of our church this week, both to give a great number and to serve. Mm-hmm. So what do you, for both of you, if you could just share, if every person took that next step in serving and in giving, if we were doers of the word, yep. what, what would our cities look like? What would our church look like? Well, our church would, would continue to be growing in the grace of Jesus. So we are hoping and praying that 10,000 of you will serve with Seek the Good throughout the season. So some, some are doing right now in Rooted mm-hmm. in, with their, their Rooted groups. Um, some will do with their families, some will do as individuals, but it, we handed out in, on the weekend a, a bunch of what you would say some large opportunities where a, a lot of people are going to jump in and serve at a Dancing Without Limits, dancing with um, some of our special need young adults and teenagers, uh, a foster Christmas party. Uh, there, there's a lot of just really amazing opportunities to serve in that way. Mm-hmm. And, then and, and then there'll be some other opportunities to serve too. But we, but we are hoping that 10,000 of our people will serve. I, I care about both groups. I care about the people we are serving. So I want those, those special needs teenagers at the dance to have a time of their life. Yeah. But I also care about the person who's serving to go home that night blown away mm-hmm. that he or she got to, got to serve and got to be a part of bringing a smile to that young adult's face, oh, yeah. right? It's we can basically guarantee yes. it. <laughs> oh, I can. Oh, we can yes, guarantee it. It's, tran- it's transformative. You That's know, good. on the other side of that serve experience, you are not the same right. because mm-hmm. you've had that mirror. Like you've seen God's yes. love and heart on display in a way that, you know, changes you. Totally. So I, I want it so bad for the people we're serving. I also want it so badly for the people in our church. So sign up for Seek the Good. You, you have to do it. I mean, we, we're make, trying to make it super easy, put all the opportunities in front of you, but you have to not be a hearer of the opportunity. You have to mm-hmm. be a doer mm-hmm. of the opportunity. You have to get out your phone and look at your calendar and say, I'm blocking this time off. Yeah. You got to get your family together for at dinner this week and say, guys, listen, I know we're busy, but, but, but we're going to choose one together right now, and we're going to do this as a family. You have to get your life group together and say, hey, hey, in, instead of us spending more time talking about this thing, can we take a couple of moments and choose a time that we're going to serve together? Right. You have to do that. We're, we're, we're doing all, we're, Gloria and her team are doing all the work to make it super easy, but you have to take the time to, to choose a place to serve. Yeah. And to answer your question of, you know, what would our cities look like? Um, one, I think transformation. I think we'd have fearless world changers because our hearts would be transformed and God then sends us out into our world. But the other one too, I think is unity. I think our our church, our families, our communities um, would have so much unity because what happens when you are serving, when you step out of yourself, when you step out of your, you being the focal point of your world, your story, right? Is it shines the light with Jesus being in the center and us kind of taking that proper position, right? Which is Jesus in the center, the light shining on him, on what he's doing. And there's a reason we're, you know, kind of putting this ask out there right now and getting ahead of the holiday season is we we know that train is coming Mm -hmm. and we know that cultural train is going to tell us this is a season about us. You know, what's my family doing? How are we provide? What is, you know, Christmas season, all of that. What does that look like for us? This is an opportunity to shift that perspective, celebrate a little differently this season and shine the light on Jesus. And we do that when we're serving. Yeah. Love it. So beautiful. Mariners Church, we believe in you. Yes, you'll do it. We're excited to be in this season together. Gloria, thanks so much for joining us. So amazing. Thanks for having me, you guys. Let's seek the good. Let's do it. Let's do it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us today on the If I Had More Time podcast hosted by Mariners Church. 
We hope to see you next weekend at any of our congregations across Southern California or online. To view our service times at each congregation, be sure to check out our website at marinerschurch.org.